Charlie, what lien do we have uh, finding these leads? Uh, you said you have uh, the city have uh, the on, on the sir lease? Yes, yes. Uh, one of them, our customers started complaining about having it, so we rotted it. Uh, we, we went to look at couldn't find nothing, so we went to dig it because we thought the main was collapsed. When come to find out, his service is uh, they had a, they flushed a half a pair of blue jeans down the down the drain. So uh, his line collapsed, they flushed, it busted the bottom out of out of the city main, so we had to go in and fix it. Uh, the other one that we done, we rotted it with the with the jetter, and we can make it so far. Uh, and we just came from the other direction, made it to another point, and that gave us a just a place to look. We started digging and we found a big cavity <coughs> just in the sediment. And you know, you know, it would turn out slowly, but not real, real fast. Most of those that we find though, because of the customer complaints. I mean, unless we just happen to see it. Yeah, I got a picture of someone who sent them to Terry, and that way she can post them on a page or with the, the blue jeans and stuff where some of the stuff. Where did you left a pair of blue jeans? I'm not for sure, but they they done. We don't know. That's why their that's why their sewer line was stopped up though. That they had a plumber over there trying to uh, open it up and wanted, I guess when they were snaking and they just busted the back the back of the house with the city might be up and just collapsed. And I'll just take this opportunity to tell everybody that the public is aware. We have a uh, no anti fog Friday campaign going on. So every Friday we post um, about the fact that you shouldn't flush or uh, pour down your drain fats, oils, and grease. Um, now that does not include baby wipes, diapers, underwear, blue jeans, uh, many, many other things that we find in the sewer. But when you flush those things, they will stop up probably not your sewer line, but they'll stop up your neighbor's sewer line. And, um, and then that little neighbor downstream from them and it causes a real problem. So we like to make sure everybody knows, please, even those wipes that say they are flushable, they really are not flushable. They will not travel through the whole length of the sewer line and get to where they're supposed to go without causing some problems. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Next is Mr. Brian Rogers, City Inspector. Special limitations of being around large groups. However, 
Our kids are doing great in all caps. Grades are awesome. We also have received great results from parents and teachers on the kids' behavior and attitudes at school and home. We work on those areas as well as character. We are geared up to hit this last semester extremely hard with studying as the kids are getting extremely tired and frustrated with school slash virtual days, etc. We will be open this summer. We will be open this summer for our nine-week program. We will post flyers and info next week and start taking applications in mid-April. Thanks again, Patina. So I appreciate her sending that to me. Um, next is Mr. Van Boyce for the Planning Commission. Good evening, everyone. Good to be back. Um, lots, lots going on. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit on, on what's happening with planning. But first, a little background. Um, before we can start making plans or drafting ordinances, state code lays out what the planning commission is supposed to do. And first, we have to prepare, well, prepare a comprehensive study of present conditions and probable future growth of the municipality in its neighboring territory. And the second thing is that the commission will prepare a map showing streets, public ways, and boundaries of the area within the jurisdiction for which it will prepare plans, ordinances, and regulations. The map shall be known as the planning area map. And that jurisdictional area, um, by the way, is set by the state code. It includes uh, everything one mile beyond the city limits. Well, thanks to the, the good work of Michael Gilbert from Eagle Forestry, we now have the official required and current planning area map. Um, the commission studied it as did Judge Aiken, and I have filed that map with the city clerk and with the county recorder. And I also hope to have smaller copies available for the council members soon. So we got that taken care of. It's a, it is a slick map. Um, and, uh, Dr. Dalton has a copy right, right there. Yep, so there we are. This uh, is not. That is not okay. a so that means that the comprehensive study has become our focus for the rest of this year. <coughs> and there's a lot happening with that study that uh, council should know about. We've begun gathering input from residents that is critical to our work. You remember that in, in January we had a community survey that was coordinated by the Community Development Institute at the University of Central Arkansas. Next week, um, Staff from that institute will be in Monticello to give a public presentation and an analysis of the results of that survey. And I hope that everyone here will be able to attend in person or uh, watch the visit we speak on Facebook. Those survey results will be critical for helping us get a sense of where the community is now and what some of the residents' main concerns are. That survey also has served notice that we're now actively seeking input from all Monticello residents about their ideas and their aspirations, their hopes and their dreams. And we'll be following up on this survey in a number of ways, doing all we can to make sure that everyone in Monticello has a chance to be heard. Next month, the Institute from UCA will conduct a walk audit of the Monticello downtown. Engineers from the state's leading civil engineering firm, Kraft & Tull, will take a tour of downtown and then report back to us on their findings with suggestions on best practice, planning methods with respect to complete streets, accessible parking, crosswalks, sidewalks, bicycling, trails, and, and other facilities. Monticello was selected for this walk audit, by the way, from over 30 applications from other cities. And this will be another great step for planning and for the downtown and the merchants. Nita very soon will tell you about another fantastic event coming up in August. And this will be a third project awarded to Monticello by the Community Development Institute that will have a significant impact on our city. Now, I, I feel it's important uh, for me to acknowledge the work of Nita McDaniel and we are receiving these three awards. These were there were many applications from all over the state for these, and they were the awards were made on the basis of the quality of the applications. 
Mita was responsible for the time and the effort of the application and the follow-up. I cannot stress enough to Council how significant these will be and central to our plan as we move forward. Finally, the, the package of maps from Eagle Forestry, for which we are tonight requesting funding, will help us get an accurate picture of Monticello, including uh, physical aspects of the city, roads, sidewalks, paths and trails, <coughs> parks, land use, and, and all the other physical aspects of our city. These maps will help us plan, and they will be available, of course, for all city and council use. So, in, in summary, before we can move ahead with planning, we really need a solid grasp of where we are, and that's what the community study is about. We've made some good progress, and you, council members, will be central leaders in helping us gather and hear the residents and in helping us articulate a vision for our future. And that is my report. Glad to field any questions. And the meeting we talked about next week on the result. Where are the meetings at? That will be uh, the yeah. Fine Arts Center at the University. And it's on the 30th. On the 30th. 30th, okay. Isn't that Monday? I think so. Yeah. Monday at 5 30. Tuesday at 5 30 at UAM. 5 30. 5 30. Yeah. They'll go over that again, but <laughs> we want y'all to show up. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Okay, next is Ms. Pam McEwen for the Senior Citizen Center. What is the number to contact you? Uh, 367-2434. What'd you say? 367-2434. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, have a good night, everybody. Good well. Thank you, Pam. Okay, next is Nate McDaniel with NBC.
of the economic development team that we have here in Monticello. Mayor Chase, Dr. Katie Dawes, myself, our police chief, Jason Akers, of course, our board president, Amy Ryburn. Who am I forgetting, Mayor? That was that's our team that met with them when we today. Ward Brown. Oh, and Ward Brown. They requested a local contractor to meet with us. And uh, Ward is very respected and has ample abilities within his company to meet the needs that this prospect is asking for. We showed the prospect our speculative building. And that meeting went so smoothly. Each one at the table did an amazing job of presenting the information exactly the way the prospect needed it. And the feedback that I have is that, uh, and this is one that came to us through our Arkansas Economic Development Commission, and the project manager shared with me that the, they were very impressed with us. They loved the building. When we showed up the building, uh, the owner's eyes just really lit up. He, he liked what he saw. All of the information I was able to give them on um, everything from <coughs> shipping and transportation, it was checking off all of the little boxes on the list. Now, I say all of that, um, we're not sure what will happen moving forward. I'm continuing to communicate with them, but the only reason that we would not land this one is if they're looking at two other buildings in you know, other states is if that community is able to do more for them than what we're able to do. Because we checked all the boxes <coughs> and our team, I think, did an amazing job of presenting to them. They feel very welcome. And I also want to give a huge thank you to our county judge, Robert Aiken, Mayor Chase, the city public works, Sheriff Mark Gover, um, Mark uh, Cruz from uh, Arkansas Department of Corrections out of the Dermont unit, and EFSGO technology employees, CR Boats employees. We had businesses, churches, all out picking up the litter. And the litter had become a real problem. When I started driving the route to prepare for this visit on Wednesday, and I'm looking at the garbage in the streets, and, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm selling a dump is what I'm selling. But everybody stepped up. We, we've been hit hard. Uh, the county's been hit hard because of the ADQ show down in Landfield. Um, with the weather problems that we've had, our trash was much worse than it typically is. But everybody stepped up to the plate, and we got things cleaned up in such a short amount of time. It was miraculous, really. And I want to thank everyone because that's exactly what it takes for us to be able to sell our community. And we just got to keep that plan rolling and keep us looking at the future. We know we are. So I wanted to thank everyone for that. Um, <clears throat> and I will keep you posted as that one uh, moves forward. Um, it is a really good project. It would fit beautifully within <coughs> our economic lending study, so I'm, I'm going to work as hard as I can to get this one here. Um, I work on all of it as hard as I can, but eventually we're going to win one. Um, I don't really have any updates on transportation at this time. I know we're holding for the SIP, um, but I will tell you, uh, well, actually it closed on the night. The State Highway Commission had released the state transportation improvement plan that goes up for public comments through the 9th of March. In that step is the Scoggin Drive Extension Highway 83 um, uh, project. It is actually programmed for going to be in next year. It's in the plan, gone through public comments, it's there. As well as the future Interstate 69 corridor, the Eastern Bypass that's constructed now, the part where we were successful in getting them to move the funds from Gilman to the west to connect to <clears throat> US 65 uh, just near the east is in the plan for 2022 as well. 
they will, and in that plan, it is to construct two lanes of that. So it will be much like what we're seeing on 530 Big Pine Bluff that will have connecting 65 near the week. So both of those things for Drew County are in the city. So that's exciting that we're actually moving forward on two very large projects for us. Um, to pick up on what Dan said, um, I will be sending out email invitations uh, because of COVID-19 restrictions. As you know, we can't have as many people in the Fine Arts Center as we typically or as it will hold. So we are doing by invitation only to council members and commissions uh, to actually see the data firsthand. But we will live stream it through Facebook and UAM's YouTube channel will also be streaming. So everyone in Monticello can actually sit in your living room and watch this uh, just like we've been doing church for a while now through UAM's YouTube channel. So I'm going to put that information on our Facebook page and I've sent the initial invite to press so I'm hoping everyone will help us to get that information out there. Um, again, that's at 5.30 on the 30th in the Fine Arts Center. Um, the other new thing that I have to share with you uh, kind of take the lid off of what Dan alluded to. Um, UCA's Community Development Institute is probably the most reputable institute across the United States. It's been there for a very long time. Their, this pro, uh, the CDI certification program is a five-year program. In the first four years, you can become a certified uh, community developer. And then they have their advanced year. And in the advanced year of that, that class takes on a project. And what that project is, is they actually go to a pick a community in the state of Arkansas and they do what they call a first impression tour. We're that community this time. So we're now uh, preparing. We don't have a date set for it yet. Monticello has been selected for CDI's advanced year group to come here and do a first impression tour. Now what that is, is this group of community developers who have gone through all these years of training are going to come here and they're going to uh, drive through our community. They're going to visit our businesses. They're going to visit uh, and walk and they're going to take notes, and then they're going to sit down with us, and they're going to give us feedback. And that is huge for what the Planning Commission is working on. It's huge with what we do in economic development. Um, so I'm excited about that because this will actually give us, you know, what others see it. Uh, you know, we, we think we know who we are and what we are, but what do others think? So this can be very constructive criticism um, for us. So I'm excited about that. Um, we are, our reloan fund also continues to grow. We are continuing to market through the state websites as well as through social media. So we are continuing to work on those things. And but those are highlights. So I guess at this time, if you have questions, I will be most happy to answer. The first impressions project is that, and I guess how, what's the criteria for being selected for that? Is it just a random draw or is or is something more to it than that? Oh, uh, there's a little more to it than that because I had to fill out basically the same type of application for that as I did when we were selected for the community catalyst program, which we're still in the process of, but what they look at is number one, how much cooperation does the community have between city and county government and business and economic development, you know, how well are we working together? They look at those things. And they also look at, you know, you know, where are you as a community? Are you on the uphill slide or are you on the downhill slide? Um, <coughs> A lot of those things go into play. And because we have made such great progress through the community catalyst program, I do think that's one of the reasons we were selected for the first impressions tour. And I'm really excited about what you'll be hearing on the 30th because we really did. We got some pats on our backs 
uh, for the numbers that we got in the survey despite COVID. I mean, that has really impacted a lot of things. But we really are, you may not think about this, but I want you to. Monticello, we really are doing a better job of working across the board between commissions, the city council, our county government, and that is tremendously important if we do want to continue to improve and grow. There, we can't, in the position that we are, we can't not cooperate with our county government and with our, our university. I mean, I'm so excited at the level of engagement that we have with UAM right now in all of these things, with the community catalyst program, with the walking, uh, the walk audit that we're getting, and this first impressions tour. Guys, the university is huge, and of course, Last week when our prospect came to town, he wanted to see the UAB campus. We can't separate ourselves. We have to embrace our university. We have to respond to their needs just as they are responding to ours. So that's a, it is a big deal, and that, that did play a huge role in our selection for this. Any other questions? I have one question. Earlier you said uh, the expansion for I-69 East. Mm -hmm. Repeat that, explain it again one more okay. time. Right now. The bonds have been moved from this. Yes. Okay. Several years ago, um, well, let me back up. 20 years ago, there was funding that was earmarked uh, from the Department, uh, Federal Department of Transportation for the construction of a portion of Interstate 69, the future corridor in Arkansas. Not near enough money to build all the way from the Mississippi River to Texas, nor was there enough money to build a bridge. As you know, that corridor will uh, also include a new bridge across the Mississippi River. And I believe the price tag several years ago that I was told was like, $1.3 billion just to build the bridge. That's a lot of money. We had this small amount of money, and I think it has been about 20 years ago, I'll check the dates on that, that um, the planning and feasibility studies for it were conducted by the Department of Transportation, and it was decided that they would build the Monticello Bypass, which started at Highway 278 East and circled around to Highway 278 West, close to where our sports complex is. That's a bypass. That's a bypass. I'm an economic developer. Bypasses kill economies. They don't help them. Especially one that's that far south of our retail corridor. Everything we have business is on Highway 425, 278 near that intersection. If we build a bypass around Monticello, <laughs> it can hurt us. I worried about that for years. When I took this job, I don't even know, I think about how many years ago that's been now, that was in the back of my mind. Well, I had always understood that once something like that is programmed in the state transportation plan, it's not ever changed. It's going to happen exactly the way it's been planned. Well, I'm a little bit stubborn and hard headed, and I had this in my head. I talked to my board president of the board members, and I said, Would you be okay to start asking questions if it's possible to move that money? Instead of completing this bypass, and understand the construction of the Eastern Park was already under construction at this point. So I started asking the questions. And what I was told is you're going to have to get a consensus in Southeast Arkansas that this is what the most of the county judges and mayors want to have happen. So I spent months visiting with mayors and county judges all around the region. And what I found out is none of them really wanted that bypass to be completed around Monticello either. They, they 
some of them said I really have a dog in the hunt, and others said I really think that it's smarter if we do exactly what we're doing now, and that is complete a new road that would have a 65 mile an hour speed limit on it that would connect us from U.S. Highway 65 into Shea County to Highway 425 South in Monticello. So we were able to get that done. It was a lot of work, but we were able to get that done. So now, when you turn off of U.S. 425 South in Monticello, when this construction is completed, you can follow that corridor all the way to the east. It helps with transportation for industry. Basically, along the new power line. Where the power line is, they ran that corner there. You mean the new trans transmission line that you right. just put in? Right. Well, no, it won't be exactly lined up with it, but it may be close. It may be close. It may be kind of, you know, there's a, a T line out of Chico County that runs into the shade as well, that runs kind of uh, parallel to you. Yeah, it'll, it may be kind of like Okay, I, okay, I got you now. Because the maps I've seen, that's what it's looking like. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? You know, on the, on the thing about the prospect of the buildings, when you were closing that, you said you felt real good about where we were. Um, there were two other communities in other states, and the decision may come down to what those cities do to attract them. Mm -hmm. So. And I don't know yet. Um, when we had what meetings, are those? What are those what, things? Some possibilities. What, yeah. What are those things that they may be doing different than the city of Monticello may be doing? Well, and Paige can attest to this. When we met with them Wednesday, they didn't really ask a lot of questions about state incentives or local incentives. They did go back to Little Rock Big Bay to see about tax credits. That's the only thing they were asking about at that point were tax credits. Now, when it comes down to it, because they're crunching their numbers, they're trying to determine what's it going to cost us to put this facility here as opposed to here. Transportation costs will be factored in, and we can't control that. But I did give them some information that they were not aware of that I think may have really helped us on that side of it, praying. But once they crunch all of their numbers, that they've got a bottom line as far as, you know, the most that they're going to outlay to make it happen. Other communities have a lot deeper pockets than we do. There's some that we compete against that have a dedicated economic development tax, and they have millions of dollars in their war chests that they can uh, put toward infrastructure. And they understand <coughs> it's not right to check who that's coming and say, Here, here's somebody to do with it what you want. It's, okay, you're going to have to spend $1.2 million in energy to locate electricity. I don't think we're there with energy anymore since we had the new T line, but there's cost for that. There's cost for extending fiber optics. We do have fiber optics right there at Edward Forks Drive now, so that's better. But there's lots of those little pieces. And some communities you can write a fat check and say we can offset all that infrastructure cost. So I'm we were we were the first of the three sites that they... They did not tell me that. Okay. Do you know the other two sites? I have a suspicion that one of them is in Georgia. And that's not confirmed. Just a suspicion. But I do know there are two other buildings that are looking at. But I, I put my heart and soul in it. I'm telling you. I tried to she did. think of every little nuance, every little thing that was on their checklist, and I think I went above and beyond on a couple of them. I work at my hardest, I promise. <laughs> it was a good meeting. I think it was. I felt really good about it. And we did do a driving tour, and it was funny because Sometimes it's, it's very little with the driving tour. They want to know what this building is and where this is. This time, about five minutes in, he was done seeing that stuff, and then he just started talking to me one on one and asking questions. And I think we developed a good rapport. And that doesn't happen often. And 
I really felt like it was a positive, not a negative. I'll read the letter that she wrote. What kind of lights I can read it and then turn off so
how they street is, is that the street off North Connolly that turns back to the east from there to uh, Highland Dairy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, yes, sir. East of yes, sir. and if you uh, look at the last five pages, uh, you can see uh, the flooding. You literally, if you had a flat boat, at any given time, you would, you would ride a flat boat down that street. Which uh, which rainstorm was this, Al? Sir? Do you know which rainstorm this was for this, these last five pages? Okay, this one. In a big rain. rain. Uh, in a big rain. In a big rain. In a big rain, right. This one was uh, in 2019. But any large rain, it was it, uh, it flooded. Does the water get in the house? Uh, yes, ma'am. And this just not in one house area. It's all down the street. So how these last five pages you refer to, do you know how often this occurs? I mean, is it like, I mean, you said big rain, I mean, is it like a two inch rain does it, or is it, I mean, I can't answer that, but when you have uh, a large rainfall, uh, one or two days, uh, it, it, it floods. So it happens rather often? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I think uh, when, I, when Cedric and I was contacted back in uh, 2019, uh, he and I went over at different uh, times, and the time I went up over, I called LM, which was the superintendent of the city at the time, and uh, he assessed uh, the damage, I mean, the, the, uh, the ditches and the properties, and then I think he got Charlie, him and Charlie went over, and the mayor was contacted, and then uh, my club engineering was contacted, and a plan was written. So that's where we are on this. There is a written plan in place. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, it, it is a McClellan did a preliminary study, oh. and and the the issues are not just on Baker Street; they're all over Montcelli. And some of these open. Um, Pictures you see that look like sinkholes, that's all over my cell everywhere. But the, um, the question is, so is that the, the, the property is being flooded all over my cell Well, some of it, yes, sir. Not, not quite as severely as Douglas Street. Um, but, so I asked McClellan to draw up a, give me some preliminary plans on, you know, how we can fix this. And if you, we, I've got some, plans for them to fix specific spots in Monticello, which we talked about before. They're one's $30,000, another's $18,000, another's $60,000. You know, those take care of one specific address, okay? But that's going to cause, from what I understand, the way they explained it to me, that will cause problems upstream and downstream in those locations. So I said, well, what can we do? How do we fix that? Well, they came back with a, I believe they uh, divided the city into four basins, okay? And they talked about taking one basin at a time and fixing drainage in that area and then moving to the next one. Um, and I, the way they talked about it, and this was in 2019, um, those are, are more affordable and um, easier bikes to take. Um, although they're not going to be cheap, they're going to be very expensive. Anyway, that's where we are. When COVID happened, and oh. <coughs> okay. So you said something about basics. What you mean? What you? What do you mean basics? Well, the city <coughs> has maybe natural areas that drain, and they divided. City up into those basins. Uh, okay. Not in the well, this proposal being already brought to the board and McClellan, 
I think one issue is that we need to look at maybe not how many is being flooded, but what's being flooded. Because this is the only one that I know of that the whole neighborhood is flooded. It's flooding. Yeah. As far as flood wooded area or something like that, we're flooding houses in this area. Mm -hmm. Now, I could have forgot or whatever, but I don't actually recall clearly giving up. They didn't. They never came and, and presented that because by the time they got it done and we started, COVID happened and nobody was going anywhere. Nobody was presenting it anywhere. And um, what we do is we were working on the levy and the post office that was, uh, walls were about to fall down and uh, sewer ponds were in you know, deep stuff with ADEQ. So we had these other huge, expensive, and we didn't know how much they were going to cost, projects going on that, you know, when I went and looked, I don't remember <coughs> being told that people's houses were flooding, but, it, but I put drainage citywide on my whiteboard in my office because it's a serious problem, and I know we need to deal with it. McClellan, you mentioned the four basins. Is that what you said? I, yeah, I think it's four. Area. It may be three, but yes. Okay. Did they identify where the worst, worst of the mm -hmm. least is? Not at that meeting that we had. Okay. No. So we don't know if Davis Street is in what would be considered the worst basin right. or, right. or not. Where that right. Is. There are several. There are several places that are bad. I mean, we're just going to have to pick one and go work there deal with the problems that that causes in the other basins and then pick another basin and do that. And well, I would be willing to bet that this Davis Street neighborhood is probably the worst because we haven't heard that about Anybody else in other mind. areas. Right. So my recommendation would be that to go the basin route, but to start at the basin where Davis Street is included. Right. Okay. It, because, I mean, if we go the other route, the well, one name first, I mean, there's a lot of areas, I was the property that's on some of them, that are really close to being like a Davis Street, but if, well, so if we do something there that makes this worse, well, then we're going to flood a lot of other people out. Right. So I like the basin idea, and I like starting wherever that basin is in, within Davis Street. Okay. Well, I, I called uh, McClellan about three weeks ago and said, Okay, y'all get ready. This is our next project. So, um, and they were trying to email me these this map of these spaces today, but they didn't get in the office till almost five o'clock, so I couldn't get them. So, so what, right what is the plan going to present? Uh, hopefully, a plan? plan to fix the drainage in a basin. And is so it plan to cost? Well, I hope so, yeah. I mean, it right. should. I mean, I'm it'll not be just saying we need to put water here, here. Yeah, it'll be an estimate. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. I and mean, that's, that's the only reason for it to come. Right. We need to know how to start and what it's going to cost. Right. Is this area in a flood zone? Um, yes. It is. It is in a flood zone? It is. Uh -huh. Which um, is why I brought, which is why I have this map pulled up, because this blue is all flood zone. And this blue is a flood zone. And you know, it's really not that far from here to here. Um, but this is Dutton Street, and it's right, I think that flood zone goes, you know, right over there. Okay. You know, I think it was Monday this week we got an email from the OEM coordinator, mm -hmm. Mr. Griffith, mm -hmm. talking about the Arkansas Division of Emergency Man Management Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. And in there, it specifically says uh, funding right. for, yeah, mm -hmm. so that we contemplated if that's something that we could apply for, it would help us in these areas. Well, you can't, yeah, I mean, that obviously we would apply for that if it fits, if we fit the criteria. But we've got to have, but you can't just apply for that stuff without having a plan, without having a cost estimate, without having um, lots of information from lots of other entities. And this well, in this uh, situation probably for engineers. 
I must admit, I'm not familiar with this process, but this indicates that what you need to send in is a notice of intent. Notice of intent first, right. Which the deadline for that is April 12th. Right. And everything else will follow after. Right? Yeah. I, mean, I would certainly think we would want to get with McClellan and see what we can do to make sure we don't miss that deadline. Right. It's worse than the 525. Yeah. Um, in this area, do we know what ditch or tributary or whatever is causing the problem? Well, not for ditches back well, here, but it's... What it is from what I, from my understanding and from what I've seen, the, the drain, the culvert in front of the house, where the water drains, it cuts through two people's yard. And it's collapsed to where it doesn't drain two guys. So, so that causes the whole neighborhood flood. Yes, so when they developed it or whatever the case, you know, it, how, how they done it is there. But the, the from my understanding, from what I saw then, the actual problem is between two hours. Okay. Where the drain ran underground to Godfrey Hills, which separates the houses from Jordan Park. Not yet, the houses from Jordan Park. So, by it taking the water so slow, everything flows. Water's gonna go sooner or later, but it's gonna go in Can you remember if that ditch runs under the street? Is it there now? Yes, what it does is where it comes from side of this street. Where it comes from side of Bridges house, it's, it's, it's like a 36 inch culvert. And right back in the backyard, there's a concrete where they that they want to gun the turns. They got a concrete, like a little palm pour, so it it drain, but it also gives it relief. And then it turns and goes right down Marydale two uh, got three ditch right there. What it is, there's two ditches that run there. There's got three ditch, and then there's the ditch that runs right through here from uh, right off of 278. And those two meet at the back side, at the back side of the Jordan Park. What it is, from, from where it comes from, this Bridges house, is this galvanized pipe. It's been there for years. The bottom's rotted out, it's curled up. And it's, it's started rotting in the sinkholes. Uh, then you get right down, Behind the house, and they dug up a little concrete pond. It's like what it does, it turns it because all the water was going straight to the other house. And there was some, you know, brush there. And we cleaned it up, and it's got the water. There's a lot of leaves and stuff that's in it. But once we got that, it started helping some. But during a heavy rain, it is not a whole lot. The pipe, what it does, it goes from a 36 to a 24. What it does, it stairs steps down, and it's filling it up, and it's not letting it go as fast. Yes, I walked over there. Uh, I was right there at her back door. She had a piece of plywood because there was a sinkhole the sink there. And she yeah. didn't want to bite the in. Yes. And what it is, like I said, it starts off with a big pipe, then it goes to a small one, and it makes this turn. And a pipe restricts it a whole lot faster. You know, it restricts it more than a open ditch would because it's got to force it all down to that. So, Charlie, are these sinkholes being caused because there's holes in these culverts? Uh, yes, the culverts have gotten out. They've been there probably 15, 20 years. They're just sitting there. And they just, water runs through it with all the, all the, with, you know, the, I guess. That's what happened to the one in uh, the no, cemetery. Out. That's why the cemetery yeah. is that so, big ditch is up there. Because the, so the culverts are on personal property? Or? It's, it's right on the line, yes. Oh. The so, ditches. The ditch on Davis, you know, I agree with my house in it over the top of the road because I had to go in there that my couple on stop covers when the night. But the ditch it comes down and it turns and goes through. If the covers was in good shape, it would take it. You know, because for years that did nothing good. The older they got, they started you know, collapsing and, and then the dirt where the sinkholes are, they don't wash down into the pipe and it's it's not built in the pipes and it's not that but uh, are the on personal property, on property? Yes. Which is part of the problem. Yeah, yeah my question was going to be, you know, uh, and uh, Mr. City Attorney may have a help of this, there was an ordinance that we passed a couple years ago or so about drainage. 
classified the ditches every day. And in that, if I'm not mistaken, it identified responsibilities. Is that right? Correct. So that's why I was trying to get where these were at, because we do have an ordinance on the books that addresses. There's a hierarchy, basically, the larger the drainage ditch, the more active the city has the right to be. Repeat that, say it again. Well, the larger the drain, generally speaking, in the ordinance, so I guess it will speak for itself, but just conceptually, the larger the drain is the more people impacted, it's in a higher tier. And I, it seems like maybe there's three tiers in the ordinance. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what yeah, it is. Yeah, me neither. But, uh, I mean, I, I do agree that it, it is an issue. And I do think that uh, we should pursue some remedy to it for McClellan and try to apply for this grant process to see what we can do. But I do think we need to research to make sure we're not doing something that goes against that ordinance. <coughs> it is contrary to that ordinance, and it's something that I feel that we still need to address, and we just have to make an end somehow. Mr. Leonard, or Ms. Beard, since you keep saying this, is this affecting or flooding the residents on both sides of Davis Street, or is it primary? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You turn off at the oh, yeah. Just what turn off calmly down. Yeah, well, Coleman, the, what I was going to talk to you over there, you turn off there, probably, I said, probably 50 yards or so from that point on, going east toward the park, you know, in that, on that drive of Davis, it's flooded. If so, we get a, if we get a two and a half, three inch rain, they don't call all that fine. A little bit of rain stops them. The two places that floods that I know of right offhand that floods with a big rain is Davis Street and the park that's behind uh, Walmart. Because, uh, you know, every single, the, the lower floors of uh, buildings of the, of the two stories, they flood. But they flood, Davis Street floods. If it's a small rain, it's, it, it don't. But if we get a three inch rain, those two are the main two that flood. Those are the ones that are in the flood places. Yeah. If it's a small rain, the yeah. houses on Davis Street's backyards are flooded. Yeah, the, the backyards. It, it's not getting in the houses. Now, every time it rains, they drop down that street. The and that's something that Planning Commission needs to address, too, about, you know, what create requirements for contractors. When you, when you, if you're going to build a subdivision, then you need to make sure the drainage is sufficient to support you know, whatever you put there and the, the weather that comes our way. And that's Well, one thing I think we need to actually look at, I mean, seriously look at, is taking care of this issue here because it's affecting people's houses. I know he said something like that may be grant or whatever, but that's, you gotta wait on grant, to do this. If we have the money, we need to address this issue properly first. I mean, we can wait, like I said, it's been 2019, eight, 19 since it was brought up. It is 22 years now. So I think we need to really uh, seriously look at how to resolve that. I know it was said earlier about being on private property, but I talked to a, uh, a lawyer, municipal or whatever, and he said it was a city attorney's, more of a city attorney's question when it comes to dealing with private property. But also, if it affects other properties, then you have to weigh that, you know, other people's property supersede you being able to go on someone's private property to fix the problem, in other words. And right now, I think we're at a point where it's on one person's property, actually, so it's affecting, affecting 12 to 13 houses. <coughs> How many houses are Well, even with this said, what LM was telling me that uh, the pipes, are not large enough to, uh, to push that water, to hold that water. So therefore, whether it's on Mrs. Freeman's property or not, it's going to flood. It's going to flood. Those pipes are just like you take a bottle of water, you turn it upside down, yes. only so much water is going to come out and it's going to have to start catching for air. 
if you pour some water to do it, it's got to get air in order for it to flow because it won't do it. Uh, when I was a kid, I was raised right back here. I used to play down here. Uh, and there, there used to be an open ditch that went through there. And then over a period of time, they piped it. I'm not for sure who piped it, but it was a, it was a small ditch. It wasn't a big ditch. It was let flow. But when they went to developing over towards Marydale, they wanted to change it all up and epoxy. But that's been what it used to We tried to find, um, Brian looked for me to see if we could figure out what contractor developed that street or that area. And that's so old, we couldn't figure it out. Yeah, I think this, that property has been there, uh, the early, I mean, the late 50s, yeah. Jason. I got a map that goes back to 1902, well, actually, it was a little, and this area was just some of the, the main uh, part of the city, because the city limits used to be at Old uh, Larkin Street up there. Mm -hmm. That's where so you think Davis Street was developed back in 1902? Yeah, early 1900s, yes. Okay. But that area where, where you're talking about, those brick homes going north, Maryville, and those houses, yeah, those are newer than what it is on that street. So that infrastructure would have been put in by the contractor who developed that, or, yes. right? Which would have been in the set. Well, yes, I found houses that uh, were built in 1946 all the way to 1994 on Davis Street. And there was no contractor or covenants for that, but just north of it on Marydale, it was. That was built from 1976 to 1987. What's, what's the street that, that's just south of that that runs behind Holmes Chapel in East and that ends there at, at Scott Street? Village. That's Village Street? Yes. That runs east and west? Yes, sir. Okay. East and west is going to be Trotter. Oh, it's Trotter. Yeah. Trotter. Yeah. Okay. So it's, 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 I mean, that's in the same area that that area is. Yes, sir, it floods. Okay. Yes. It floods all the way from behind. Um, that's right, smack down from, from, uh, from the from the church. 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 Yeah, from the church. From the church. From the church. And there's a ditch there off of Conway that's got the metal bridge. Yes, sir. The church there beside it and the radio place. And they've got problems too. Yeah, and that did not hold it. Does not hold uh, the water well, I agree with what Mr. James suggests we do, and what you've already done is to contact with the code. You've been back in law, and at the same time, we can research a resolution still to see just what we feel like we can and can't do, and that's the only information we get to move forward with. Can I get a copy of that? I'd like to get a resolution. Just yeah, let me join. Uh, the drainage ordinance. Say that, question. Okay. I, I just, just to admit that I, and to a certain extent, Mr. McCray said what I was about to suggest. It seemed like there is a consensus here to make what you that. One is to have McClellan look at the, at, at the area in terms of the broader basin, what all that would entail, what all it would cost. Second, while they're doing that, if they could look at this specific area and see if there is something we can do quicker and not as expensively as the whole basin to alleviate this particular problem, it may not be. And at the same time, Mr. Wigley makes a good point that we want to make sure that if we fix this, we don't break something else. And the engineer can, can help us with that, overlay their suggestions with the drainage ordinance to make sure that's lawful under the ordinance to proceed or if it needs to be amended of course the council could, could do that and also if on that grant thing all that's done is a, is a statement of the intent you know if there's not a lot of due diligence to get that file then there's no harm in getting that file and, uh, and, and, and on those four problems I think you know, you'd be able to, to go forward and like I say I think Mr. McCray basically uh, said that just before that. But those are the four things that the same law the consensus that we can see for it. Yeah. So the the information that the public has sent you on the time to see in today, do we have the privilege of taking a look at what he's already what they've already examined in that area? 
Sure. If I if that was having a hard time, he, like I said, he didn't get in his office till almost five today. And I can't find my copies. I think he left them, but you know, it was 2019, and my desk is <coughs> quite a bit since then. Um, but yeah, I will get them. I'll get them to you. I mean, it, it's it's not going to really tell you. They <coughs> map the city and it's divided. Okay, so he didn't make any real statements to the area that made a difference. <laughs> just, he just knew. They just divided it so that they could bite off one chunk at a time and, you know, figure out how to fix this, mm -hmm. then go over here and how to fix this. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was all it was. It was very preliminary. But it was the beginning. And as far as it, uh, repeat that, that grant date you said that we have, that's fine. The uh, deadline to submit your notice of intent is uh, April 12th. It, uh, it was an email from Jesse Griffin. I think he sent it to all the council members. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in, that, in there is an attachment. Those attachment notes. Yeah. Okay, anybody else have anything else to say about this? Only I can say on behalf of uh, Mr. Freeman, I thank the council for listening and uh, discussing the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, so we'll move on to the next week. I'll invite Mr. Freeman to come up and Covered in 
mortar that he was cutting out of the joints between the bricks. So that, that 40,000, I mean, how, how did that work? Did we pay and did they reimburse us on the grant? Or? Yeah, I think so. This is a, a we have to front the money. I have 115,221. Okay. And then we'll get a reimbursement of 76,814. Okay. And where does that 115 come out of? It, well, Nina has suggested it come out of the war chest or. Um, The war chest. And then the grant would just go back in into that. Right. <coughs> okay. Have we applied for that grant yet? Uh, that's what this is about. Yeah. That would be to apply for it. I move to the resolution. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Hilton, would you call the wrong place? Yeah. Close the pace. Yes. Cedric Leonard? Mm -hmm. Michael James? Yes. Al Pierre? Yes. Mark Heiner? Yes. Craig McCray? Yes. Mike Whitley? Yes. Claudia yes. Hart? Yes. Okay, thank you. That resolution passes. Um, next, we have a resolution to declare a nuisance of 509 East Main Street. Um, can I get someone to introduce this resolution, please? I'll introduce it and move that we suspend the rules and move by title one. Thank you, sir. Can I get a second? Mark James, is that you? Yes. Okay. Um, all those in favor of reading by title only, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Okay. Mr. Gordon? A resolution binding and declaring improvement situated on certain real property at 509 East James Street in the city of Monticello to be a nuisance ordering the nuisance to be abated in 30 days. Operating abatement by the city and imposition of the land for expenses incurred by the city and for other purposes. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Rogers, can you update us on if there's been any communication or progress or. <clears throat> Transmit. Um, so we're going to talk about 4.15, 6.7, and 6.12. 
6.12 is a deletion. It, it says it at the back of the resolution that we're deleting 6.12 because it would have been covered in 6.11. So I'm going to get somebody to introduce this resolution, please. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of reading by time alone, say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Thank you. Okay. Discussion? Questions? I'm curious the uh, background why we're updating it. Why we're updating 4.15? Yes. Okay. Um, it was my understanding that coming into this year um, that we were meant to bring policies to the council individually that um, currently conflicted with our practices. So that is why they've been being brought to the council in small groupings like this. Um, I know that we have an HR committee that met uh, for the first time this month. I understand that there's that process going on also, but these specific policies that I personally can't pick out to bring to you all to have them updated are something that affects the day to day. Um, catastrophic sick leave specifically, the one in our current handbook, um, it's obsolete. We can't even use it um, because of that policy, it states that you would have had to have donated to the bank in order to um, qualified for time. Well, all the employees that had donated to the bank have, are either retired or they've been terminated for whatever reason, so they no longer even exist in our active workforce. So um, our catastrophic sick leave bank is maxed out based on our current policy. Um, so that's the purpose of 4.15 being updated. Um, set 6.7 the purpose of that one being updated. Well, before we move on, oh, I'm sorry. That's, That's okay. okay. That's okay. So we currently have no employees that are contributing to the bank. They did last year because the mayor wrote a letter to internally amend the process at which we accept catastrophic sick leave donations and did an internal adjustment to our practices so we could open it back up because we had a few employees that direly needed assistance. Um, for serious ongoing health conditions that kept them out of work for longer than the 12 weeks of FMLA time. So in order to help them be able to receive their benefits still, receive their normal paychecks during that time, um, she made that judgment call, so we did type in the letter. Um, but going through the end of last year, trying to get the other handbook passed and it didn't happen, we reverted back to what was in our current written handbook um, so I'm coming back to you all today to ask to update it to what we were doing last year prior to that whole conversation happening okay. so that we can open it back up for the employees that need it. Okay. All right. So in what you propose, what you say is to, do not, is to donate sick leave. In the old policy, it says they can donate sick leave, vacation, or comp. Actually, the reason is that you don't, you can't allow that is because state law says you can't allow somebody to donate to a catastrophic sick leave bank, okay. vacation, and comp time. And whenever I was <coughs> in the city, I did look at our sick leave bank and our policy, and there were a few employees that had donated some comp time and vacation time, and I had to give that time back to them. Okay. Because we should have never allowed them to donate back to begin with. Yeah. So there were some a little bit of caveats that were put in that original policy that shouldn't have probably been in there. Okay. In your proposal, paragraph 4.15.1, uh -huh. uh, your sentence says uh, a medical condition of employee spouse, partner, or dependent child of an employee or other dependent is defined within the man. Where is that definition? It is defined, it should be defined the, at the end of <coughs> this section. See how there's a star next to that dependent, the little asterisks? If you go to the very end, I define them. I so it's it just medium 6.7. Yeah, it's right above the 6.7. A child who may be claimed as a dependent under the Arkansas Tax Act. Okay, so there should be two stars at that, at that point. <coughs> yes. It doesn't have any stars. No, it has one. The dependent? 
Well, the one says an immediate family member is defined. Under family medical leave act. And then the two star says a child member. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. It should be two star, not the one star. I have one star, but not two. Okay. Okay. And then as I read this, you get over to 14.15.4, mm -hmm. application for use. And the first paragraph says, shall be defined. But isn't that what we're doing in 4.15.1? Is defined? It seems a little redundant, but 4.15.4, the first paragraph, says things that's not said in 4.15.1. Okay, 4.15.1 <coughs> when a catastrophic illness is considered. Right. The 4.15.4 is defining what the sick leave would be used for in regards to the application process. Like the rules, like how you would classify the application of the person applying for the leave. Well, I guess you're saying it's a little bit repetitive. Well, that and plus the first paragraph in uh, 4.15.4 <coughs> refers to a participating employee which exceeds two weeks in duration as documented. It doesn't say anything about that in the first one. And then it refers to a spouse or a dependent child as defined in some IRS publication 501, which is not referenced anywhere else that I can read. So it just seems a little bit kind of out of left field to me. The dependent <clears throat> child that's defined under the IRS publication 501 is the same as what is defined under the FMLA. It's the same thing. It's just a different way of saying it. And once again, 4.15.1 is the definition of what a catastrophic, we're saying a catastrophic illness is. <coughs> and 4.15.4, that is telling you that these are the qualifications that the applications that go to the committee are going to be considered under. So it's getting a little bit more specific. So in some, excuse me, in some, I'm trying to take a job. <laughs> in some, someone can give away their sick leave time to a person who has a condition that they need more time. And so, am I correct? Not directly. They would have to donate it to, to the bank, bank and right. go through the application process to apply for time, mm -hmm. and it has to go through mm -hmm. that process mm -hmm. to, to okay. the committee. Okay. Yes. And so mm -hmm. over here, the, the final part is saying, this is what we're going to review. Yes. Your situation. This is how it's going to be reviewed, basically. Right. It's giving the how. Not right. the what, but the how, mm -hmm. I guess, is what it's doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's breaking it down. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Can I just expand on what she was saying? In the old policy, it specifically said that Lee could not be designated. But it doesn't say that in your policy. Because I did point that I did see that as well. It should say that somewhere. I may have overlooked it, but I, I read it a couple of times and I never saw it anywhere where it said Lee could not be designated. And kind of along those lines, in your in yours, you reference conditions that make them unacceptable. So you have an employee that experiences a catastrophic illness or has a need that if they have some <coughs> disciplinary type action or some other condition that makes them ineligible, if I'm reading this correctly. Is that right? Say, say that one more time, that last part. That if they, if they have some conditions dealing with either disciplinary, some action, or have, I guess, some poor attendance, that they're not eligible Correct. to receive. Correct. That seems well, that harsh to me. Harsh. So, I, mean, I, don't, I don't see that way. I just see that it says that um, that you're not being 
Discipline. And Paul is that a current or discipline? No, you're right. Okay, it does say that. Yes, there are guidelines that are included in here that do say that if you have been counseled for poor attendance, um, if you have been disciplined for a behavioral reason, that you may not be eligible for the for time from the bank. That is correct. But not necessarily so. But not necessarily so. I mean, I those are things that are considered whenever the application may be ambiguous, was but I think I see what you're what you're saying. All, all the person has to do is just say this is not I'm not being uh, I'm not abusing my leave. Is that what isn't that what you're saying? No, no, no. no. This is saying that <coughs> that we have do written documentation showing that that individual has been corrected action, that they've been written up, um, or they have excessive days off in the past for abusing their time off, where they didn't have time to cover it, sick, vacation, whatever time, pay time, and they've just been taking off of work. Does that make sense? They've just been doing it on their own, and not, and they don't have time to cover it. So this is saying that they would be eligible to apply for time from this bank, if those scenarios occur for that individual. I can see it is giving guidelines for that, where there are some people who would not qualify for those reasons. Yes, that is correct. I can see, I guess, your motivation behind that. I guess to me, you know, I, I separate that type of action, discipline and enforcement of uh, policies and attendance. I think that, to me, is a separate issue. I mean, if you have someone that is in some type of catastrophic state, uh, I just think that puts us in a really bad light to say, no, you're not going to get this. Because you missed the video, so. So, I mean, that, that's just my thing. Well, and it does say may, it doesn't say will. But our rooms are that's the discretion of this uh, HR community. Well, Another point, too, is that the HR person has discretion to grant eight weeks without committee approval. And there's no, I would think at least in that regard, too, you would want review after the fact to somehow support your actions or decisions in that as well. So, I mean, that's, that's a one-person committee for up to eight weeks. I can kind of see it both ways, but I do yeah. I do understand that you know what you're doing because I know if I was an employee donating donating my time, my sick time that was unused, I would want it to be used by someone who has in good faith who is doing the best they can and doesn't have any disciplinary issues or any attendance issues. Uh, because that, that can become a detriment to the program in and of itself because you would have a lack of participation. Well, we have no participation now. Right? Well, there you go. So, but I mean, I, I, go. I do see it both ways as well. I mean, I, I, I concur. Well, I can't use a real world example because, like I said, we opened it back up because we had a few employees that truly needed time. There was one individual had a very serious health condition. They were out of work for over four months. Um, they had exhausted all of their time. However. The reason they had exhausted all of their time is because prior to them getting this illness, they every time they would occur sick time, they would immediately take it. Every time they would get vacation time, they'd immediately take it. So there's a little bit of management responsibility there too. I, I understand that, but at the same time, the employees have a responsibility to make sure that they are trying to save some of their time in case they have something that occurs. Now, with that being said, Sick leave, you know, there are certain things that only sick leave can be used for. So that's why the sick leave policy, they need to bring a doctor's note to show that they truly were out for a qualifying reason for sick leave. In the past, that wasn't happening. That is happening now. Okay, so there are things like that that would coincide with this to make it work. You can't. One policy isn't going to work on its own standalone whenever it's regarding a curl time and leave time. They all have to be cohesive and mesh together or they, they won't work. 
Um, you don't have to do catastrophic assistance bank. I'm asking that we do this because it did work last year for those employees that were on it. Um, How many did we have had it? Um, Two or three? We had three, three. long term. We had a few that needed it intermittently. Um, so we did have that as well. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I don't think it's a good idea. I'm just questioning and bringing to light, I guess, some things that I think might be uh, problematic. Right. Well, that's currently written. That's, well, that's I would like to say that it almost seems like double jeopardy. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the discipline part, it, it sounds more disciplinary action or service than sickness because the term catastrophic itself means I didn't try to do this. Although they may have tried to be off of work and that's their, I think that's their individual thing that, that to me that comes as a personal thing on an individual as long as they're not, um, you know, uh, doing their job or, or whatever, bringing harm, but to get sick and then it's like a disciplinary action to me the way that it reads, unless we're going to say something specific that we're not, you know, we can read into this, we can try to figure it out, but if I'm an employee, I'm not sure I want you to try to figure out a sentence. If you want to say what fits or what makes it eligible, I think it needs to be more specific then. Well, the language that we're concerned with mm -hmm. uh, in paragraph 4.15.4 .4 at the bottom of the page, that's where we are. No, I'm at 4.15.2. I'm, yeah. Yeah, we good. When you request catastrophic leave, your department head must verify that you have not been disciplined for leave of use, or you must provide a copy of your physician's diagnosis detailing your Yeah, so that, that's what I'm looking at. And that reads to me as though that's pretty mandatory that if you've been disciplined for leave abuse, now that's not defined, but if you've been disciplined for leave, you know, to be eligible to be considered, your department head has to verify you've not been disciplined for leave abuse. If you can't clear that burden, then you, you're not eligible. You're not eligible. And let me back up and say, it's two years, <laughs> that's the thing about it. Well, let me, let me back up by saying also, this also includes the leave of gives these employees time in addition to their already federally qualified time of FMLA, 12 weeks of unpaid leave. That's federal law. So that already, an employee that has a serious ongoing health condition, they're gonna get that already. That's um, just uh, not If they have not free time, we use that concurrently with that 12 weeks vacation time, whatever. But that, this is, the intent of this is if they don't have time, whenever that starts, because they've worked for the city for a year and they qualify for FMLA, they have that serious ongoing health condition and they need compensation pay instead of being out of work without pay because FMLA protects their jobs for 12 weeks unpaid. But this is us as the city saying, we're gonna do more for our employees. We're gonna add this extra for benefit to our employees. So in, like I said before, you don't have to do it. I mean, it's it's an option. And, and okay, I got a question. I'm sorry. Okay, all this all this being said right here to lay down guidelines and whatever. Okay, I've somewhat heard of programs like this, mm -hmm. but why is it that you got to have this? Just say, for instance, if. Uh, Person A got sick, mm -hmm. and I had X amount of sick days on the book. Mm -hmm. Why did you come in and say I want to give them two of my day, two of my sick days directly? Directly. Um, then you eliminate your because you got first you got to get it in the bank in order to get it. If you don't have it in the bank, you can't get it. You mean donate it to the bank and then that? No, no, no. Well, how does that, that person get it? Do you want to give it to that? You want to three six three six five or six people say we want to give Mr. Charlie two of our days, not the Charlie that they work for. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you, you know, I think if you do something like that, 
something like that, you're opening yourself up more for discrimination. No, but that, that's your thing. Not, not, not simply to tell you. So right now, when you go to talk about yeah, the discipline action, two years or whatever. Okay, well, but I said I want to give you two days of my yeah, six a financial example how that could hurt you. Okay, let's say you have a, I'm going to use a, a police officer as an example because they get a lot of time. Okay, they can occur federal law, they can carry a lot of time, fire, firemen as well. Let's say one of them come in and say, oh, I want to donate, I'm retiring, I'm getting ready to leave, and I want to donate X amount of hours to Joe in parks, okay? Well, <coughs> this person's retiring and leaving, but Joe hasn't, but they're getting ready to leave the city also. Well, now they get paid out for all that time. No, so no, no, it's for, it's for six, it's not for them to put in the bank now. No, no, I'm not talking about bank. They get it no, on no, their no, books no, for their time to take. Okay. You just donate it directly to that other employee. So it's no longer that police officer's. Now it's Joe's and Parks. He has it on the books to use sick time for his illness. I, see, so I, I, don't, I don't see what, no, that's not what I'm saying. Because if you don't have it go through the bank, then that I think what Sylvia is saying is that it's someone that is qualified for catastrophic. Right. And they're due, and people are donating for their cause, not just some average person. I know, I, that's what I'm saying, but Joe and Parks qualified for catastrophic leave. So this police officer said, I'm going to give Joe, he needs time to cover his catastrophic illness. That's what you were suggesting. Can they not directly donate to that individual? That's the scenario I'm trying to explain. So this police officer donates, let's just say, 300 hours to Joe. So Joe gets that time on his on his books. He has that 300 hours. Okay. Now, if he doesn't use it all, I, I don't think it's what we're saying. If right? he doesn't go through the bank. Now, we're talking about a specific case. So if you have an employee who, who has a catastrophic requirement to be off of work mm -hmm. and that policeman recognizes that this individual mm -hmm. we're not putting his in his bank for future use we're talking about a specific time now mm -hmm. so if i've got if there's an employee who has a catastrophic illness that's going to require him or her to be away from work past the 12 weeks of family leave mm -hmm. then i think what Cedric's asking is, is why can't that person for that specific reason give it that time to that specific employee for that specific reason. Right. Not to the bank. Not to the bank not not to the bank, okay. but the call. Okay. Or you're you're, you're, you're you're sick, okay? You've extended your family leave, you're without pay. Alright? So Cedric wants to give you X amount of hours because you're gonna continue on that okay. on that catastrophic okay. deal. So what about Tracy over here? Is he gonna give Tracy the same amount of time? I, I'm not I, I'm just, I'm just trying to explain if you understand what I'm saying. I get what you're saying. I get it. So. I'm trying to get you all to understand where I'm coming from because if you allow that to happen, I don't think that's a very good practice. I'm, I don't disagree with that then at all. Gonna, then you're going to have, okay, I got that time. He gave it to me. Yeah. But then you have Tracy over here who needs time too. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't want to give Tracy time. He doesn't want to give Tracy because yeah. nobody else wants Tracy. But nobody likes Tracy. So let's, so, so, so no, nobody like nobody, ain't nobody here. Well, so it's not like I said, here. you don't have to do that. So are we, okay. is anybody getting to we the problem? We need to skip it. Are there any hours in the bank now? Um, there, it's frozen, and there's oh, about, I believe there's like 900 something hours off the top of my head. Wow, okay. Yeah. But there's nobody giving at this time? No, because it's frozen. I can't let any donate if it's frozen. What about the food? <laughs> All right, so, I'm sorry, why is it frozen again? Yeah. It's frozen because the policy it's... says you can only donate up to 320 hours, and you can't donate if, if um, you, you can only donate 320 hours in a personal time. It's maxed out, basically. And because it's maxed out, nobody else can donate. Based on our current policy and our current handbook. So this would open it back up to allow employees to donate. There doesn't have to be a max on how much hours are in the bank. Employees can donate, should donate how much ever over time. I make a motion that we table this. We had people that used the bank hours, right? Last year. 
because I wrote a uh, letter to change the policy to allow um, a couple of our employees who were desperate and really needed it. I, I allowed that to happen. And, and your then, letter stated because they had not contributed to the bank that they were eligible? My letter, no. My letter stated that, well, I don't even remember now, that we would open the catastrophic relief bank up because I don't think it said why. Yeah, it well, did say because of those that it one didn't say why. It gave guidelines as to how we were going to manage it, and this mirrors that. But the reason we did it is because we had an employee who had a catastrophic illness and um, was going to run out of time and have family. And okay, as picking that children. Well, we know, Mr. Lear, we we did that across the board for everybody that had any kind of catastrophic event occur. We didn't pick and choose. Absolutely not. We got it to everybody. I have a list of employees that were on catastrophic leave, sick leave simultaneously at different times through that year of all different departments of all different nationalities, of all different genders, of all different everything. So it was used and utilized equally across the board within the workforce. Mr. Barton has a comment. In the event that Mr. Leonard's motion to table this is met with favor um, on this, there seems to be some sentiment on the council in terms of allowing a direct transfer or direct assignment from employee to employee. My view of that is the positive view of that is you might get more participation. Would you speak I said, if you were to do that, you might get more participation because you know who your time's going to. That might might be a positive. One of the things that, that participation is not a problem. It was a problem that, last that's year. Fine. One of the things I would want to look at, and it was mentioned earlier, is what if you have one employee that's got that's, that can't attract a donation. And what if that employee is in a distinct minority? Is there a, a racial demographic, a religious demographic, where they ain't got any friends? And then have we created potentially a discrimination issue because this person that doesn't have any friends, whereas the, the, the folks that look like more people in the community <coughs> got plenty of friends and they've known them from grade school and they get plenty of donations that we create for them. I don't want to look at that. If, I don't if, if, create a healthy work environment. If, if that's your sentiment, I wouldn't want to make sure we're not kind of backdooring a, a discrimination issue. And one other thing is, again, if this is table, the way I read this in two different areas, if you're, on, if you have a disciplinary action within the last two years, including for poor attendance, and then poor attendance is mentioned in the second place, that's an eligibility criteria the way this is written. I don't see that there's any discretion on that the way I read. And that may be okay, you know, there's part of the lawyer that goes, that's great, I don't like discretion because that's how we get in trouble. On the other hand, that also means sometimes we can't make good decisions. And that ultimately is your, your guy's decision as to whether you want that there, whether you want it to be discretionary, but it's my reading that if you've had a disciplinary action two years, in the last two years, you're not eligible. If you have, what does it say, if, you're, if your department head won't verify that you've not been disciplined for leave abuse, you're not eligible. And I'm not saying those, that those are good, bad, or different. I just want you guys, as this gets tabled, when you review it, just to, to understand that's, that's how I see that. And just so the record, when I mention, I kind of feel like discriminatory, I'm not even talking about uh, race or minority. I'm talking about as in particularly sometimes we, these decisions can be based on who we like, no matter who they are. And we can let one go and the other not. And then if you go two years, now you're not given any mercy <laughs> towards maybe one year, but not two years, because you can go back two years if it say, okay, you just don't have it right this year, but in 2020, you didn't have it right at all, 
So now you can say, well, he didn't have it right at all in 2020. So although he's fair off in 2021, uh, we're not making eligible. That's why I said, if you're going to put that in there, like you may mention of some specifics, that's why I would like to be more of black and white because it's left open. Okay, so let me suggest this. So like in Senator St. Matt saying that a year prior from the date of the approved FMLA, a year prior to that, because in order for them to qualify for this to begin with, they would have had to apply for FMLA and have that certification from the healthcare provider. So go back a year from that date to see if they have been counseled for And if they were, then they would qualify to apply for the bank. But if they had been, then yeah, they could go through the application process. Is that what you're suggesting? Something. Something like that? Okay. Yeah. I mean, listen, you can do anything you want with it. I mean, it's, I have two more points that I just want to bring up. Okay. Before the time is if we're going to take it. One, it's under 4.15.3. It's the, I guess, third section down. It says that if you leave the city, your unused hours of sick leave, annual leave, or a combination of the two will be donated to the bank upon the termination of your employment. Unless you are retiring and are classified as a sworn police officer or a fire person. So, in that requirement, is that if you are a police officer or a fire personnel and retiring, then your hours won't be donated. But if you're any other employee other than a police officer or a fireman, your hours will be donated. Is that what that says? Yes, because sick leave, remember, non-uniform personnel don't get paid out for their sick leave anymore okay. um, upon retirement. It just would go away. So in order to for the city to utilize that time, you would put it into the bank so that it could be donated out to employees that need it to help maintain the bank. Um, okay. Annually, non-uniform employees would get paid out for what they're owed if there's a difference that would go into the bank um, police and fire federal law is pretty stringent and dictates how you have to pay out their time so the majority of their time would end up probably being paid out if they're if they're in the situation where they're retiring anyways so as a regular city employee someone other than a fireman or a police officer Basically, sick leave carries no cash value. Is that not when you retire? Um, it did prior to the policy the being passed retirement? and changed last month, I believe, at the council meeting. Um, and you all are more than welcome to change that. But I did cut an almost twenty-eight thousand dollar check for a non-uniformed employee when they left the city. So if that's what the city wants to continue to do, that's fine. Um, you would just need to. You know, amend that and add that back. Well, it's just in your example when you were talking to Cedric, you were talking about him donating 300 hours to someone and then him getting paid for it when they left. So, uh, I guess they can't do it. But, <clears throat> okay. I go back to the $20,000 check. You have an employee who retired. We've worked for the city for many years, and we've had quite a few employees who've worked for the city for many years. But since I have been here personally, there have been checks cut $10,000 or more. That specific employee, their gross pay was up near around $28,000. Gross. So was that for sick leave or comp? Time? Sick, comp, and vacation. They got paid out for all of that when they left. Okay, and, and, and that's all okay. just sick. That's all right. I wish that would be a job like that. That's okay. That's okay. I, you know, I, I agree with uh, Councilman Nellis. That's okay with this. But the reason I said that is uh, I managed uh, personnel for 20, 27 years. 28. Okay. Uh, the state has uh, catastrophic 
policy. Okay. If an employee has discipline in the file, whatever it is, that employee still qualifies for that leave. It is bank. Uh, upon uh, I donated uh, in dollar amount twenty nine thousand on leaves in May and get us out the leave uh, and uh, sick leave. And, uh, okay, so I would say table this, and I would research from the state, and I'll give you this information from the state, uh, how the state operate, and then bring it back to the state. I would like to add, I appreciate that, um, I would like to add that I did look at the University of Arkansas, which is modeled after the state. That's how I prepared this. So it's very similar to what the University of Arkansas does. I did not write any of these policies on my own. They were all researched. Every entity, every law that I could find was considered and read before these were prepared. Understood. So and I'm, and I'm coming fine. from understood and I'm coming from the Department of Human Services where uh, we serve mm -hmm. we serve people. And and I think with uh, looking at our our uh, staff with the city we should give them all that we can give them. However, if uh, they have discipline in their policy or not, we should go to, uh, I mean, you got, you got cancer, uh, heart, heart problems, whatever problem it is that they need to time uh, to relook at this. So, uh, all right, well, we've got a motion to title it, and Mr. Peer, I'll consider your motion as a second. Um, yes. So, all those in favor of titling this resolution, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Thank you. We'll move on to um, item number G, discussion uh, regarding NeoGov services. And uh, this, can I get somebody to introduce this resolution, please? I'll introduce it and I move we suspend the rules and we go title on. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor of reading my title only? Aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Resolution authorizing purchase from Neo Dub. Okay, this is a um, program that we can purchase that allows, if you, if you read the, the uh, document dated March 16th, subject NeoGov software. Um, the two product options, that's the description. One is electronic forms, the other is electronic uh, training model, um, and these, these items will benefit our public works employees, parks employees. Um, well, and they'll also benefit HR. You want to speak about this, Patty? I can. Um, e forms specifically will benefit the entire workforce. Um, it is making, and it's going along with our records retention policy, aiding it and being compliant with that. And um, IT in the box. And what? And IT in the box. And IT in the box. Um, making all electronic forms, uh, or all paper forms electronic. Um, so employees would. Have a login that's created for them with their personal, they would use their personal email for that. Um, they would have a login to the portal, to the NeoGov portal. Um, they would get notifications to their private email whenever a form is up for them to complete or fill out, or if their supervisor has sent them something that they need them to complete, um, they can go on there and request their days <coughs> off. If their supervisor would then get prompted to go and approve it or deny it. Um, it, it cuts out a lot of the paper. Um, once all of that is completed, those processes, they then get sent to HR. <coughs> HR gets prompted to then approve, move it if they need to, sign off, whatever 
they need to do, and then um, all personnel files are stored electronically. So it would, depending on what it was, what it is, it, it could automatically be prompted to go directly into that file um, for retaining. You can set retention dates um, for different types of documents, where the system will automatically maintain that for you. Um, it helps gather information um, in the event that we have to gather a lot of information for personnel for retirement. Um, all, all of the above. Um, learn. Learn is a training module where supervisors or HR would be able to send videos with training quizzes annually for annual training um, in regards to harassment, um, sexual harassment, um, EOC training, um, and then public works, um, combined space training, just different, various different trainings. Um, there's financial module uh, training for you know, finance departments, there, there's different types of trainings. There's even trainings on, on how to use Microsoft Office and Excel and different things like that. Um, so there's over, I believe, 389 different training modules that could be sent to employees. And they would be able to do those and accomplish, accomplish those on their own. Um, my goal is to set up um, training centers with tablets and like kind of listening centers where employees could schedule with their department heads to come in and sit and log in and do that during work hours um, if there is time. Um, this is to help eliminate disruption of departments and workflow in those departments because um, what we've been doing since January of this year is meeting on Wednesdays, some Tuesdays, uh, but mostly Wednesdays in this room, and we've been dividing up parks and public works um, to accomplish these various trainings that they need. Um, senior Center, I spent a whole week over there, so it's just um, the way it's being done is very time consuming, um, but we had nothing before, so this is just moving a step into the 21st century, trying to make it a little bit more user friendly. And you can see below that where it's number one is eForms Plus uh, Learn for 18 months. The total is 15951 Number two is eForms Plus Learn for 36 months. <coughs> that is $27,075. The next one is eForms Only for 24 months, $10,000. Learn Only for 24 months, $13,000. So we left all this open. Now if you, this is a, uh, this, do, this program does qualify under state bid. What's the word? Contract. Contracts. Um, so we don't have to bid it. Um, and we left the resolution blank so that you could choose what you wanted if you wanted any of it. What is learn only? Is learn? That yeah. would be training only. Learn That's is tra training. Learn training, training. 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 All the time for them. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying you can get both or you can get one or the other. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and NeoGov has a wide variety of <coughs> HR platform software and modules you can add. Um, these are two that right now they have a special going on mm -hmm. of six months introductory period mm -hmm. to see if you like it. Um, the city of Little Rock uses Neoga. I went to their website. It's very, they use it for, they use their recruiting portal, which is fabulous. You, as an outside person, can go to their website. You create your username and login for their Neoga um, recruiting portal, and you can go on there and fill out their application online. It sends it where it needs to go for review. Um, through that, their HR department corresponds with those applicants. So, um, and I'm sure, actually I'm pretty sure that they use a lot of the other modules, but that's one that you can see as a private person going to just to the City of Little Rock's um, website. So, um, we would not be the only city in Little Rock that would be utilizing this. Um, 
I did have a conversation with some individuals at municipal aid. Um, they are going to be trying to work with NOW to try and get some type of an agreement in place to try and get municipality discounts in Arkansas. That just hasn't happened yet. It's in the early stages. So there are opportunities there as well. Like with that in a box, we were able to get a, a member discount. So they're trying to get that agreement in place. So maybe in the future we could qualify for something like that also if we chose to move forward and add extra modules in the future. Um, so. Patty, which option is would be your recommendation? Well, um, I, I know that we have financial concerns with sales tax and things like that. Um, so I think financially, as far as that goes, probably option one would be the best option. However, if you're looking just at comparing what you're getting for what you're spending, number two <coughs> is a great option also. Number two um, breaks down to $9,025 a year. And it's spread over. So you get your three years, you're just paying for your three years. Plus you're still getting your first six months for free on both of them. So. And let me add, can I add something? Um, tell me if I'm not too this right. When we went over the, the budget information, the funding information at the finance committee meeting, when we increased that 5405 line item, that for this year, that's only for the setup. That'll be strictly an administrative expense. This will be invoiced out. The next time this is invoiced out, it'll be the 2021 budget. I mean, the 2022. Right. <coughs> and at that point, we had talked about actually dividing it out between the departments getting a percentage of employee, you know, how many employees you have in that department and dividing it out by employees. So for the purposes of this year's budget and that amendment that we would make, if you chose one of these, it would just be for whichever one meets the setup. The other would be invoiced next year. So a couple questions. These calls and fees, are they determined by the number of employees, number of training units? How is that? Is no, there a set fee? These are determined by their fair market value. Um, That's not, I don't know what that means. We mean by the fair market value. You have a packet, each table, I put a packet in between each of you. That is from me of the, that should explain how they determine their pricing, I believe, within that. But can you um, tell me how they determine their pricing? They do determine it based on your population size of your city, because NeoGov is designed for public agencies. That's who they gear their software cores. <coughs> they have a price tier bracket, whatever you want to call it, for population size of your city. They base it off of that, which is very similar to how I think the box does their pricing also. So are there any cities our size that use Neo I you can send me a list and I did never get the list. Um, well, I actually called them, and they only pulled up one city in their database and they told me they went to Little Rock and said, they don't. They told them. They told them. And said that they only used the recruiting. They told them? Yeah. Okay. Not anything else. I know Fayetteville's one. Little Rock has it because I specifically went myself to their website and, and they Do you use the other modules or just the recruiting? That I don't know. I, I don't know. He was going to send me a breakdown, but I did not get that far with yeah. getting that information. My concern is when you look at their customer list, I mean, it's large cities, mm -hmm. okay? And it's very expensive. So I called in this league to ask if there were other ones. So did we explore any of the other companies that do this thing? Sage, Paycom, ADP? That are specific to public agencies? Yes. I'm not aware of those. I've been talking to NeoGo for over two years, so. Yeah. Well, this will be in Sage. They say that's what Russell Miller really uses. Sage? Yeah. Is that yeah. an accounting software, though? Because. No, it's a human resource program. Okay. Like okay. Yeah. And then, um, actually, in this will be uses Takeoff. So, did we look into any of those? I haven't. I've looked at QuickBooks. I've looked at some others, but not those. I looked at Chronos. 
but the chrome is extremely expensive. Well, obviously, I, I don't know what I'm looking at, but I did look at those sites, and it does have modules very much like what I saw when I went to the Um So for me, I, I would like to make sure that we're maximizing our investment, much like what we did with IT in a box, when we did the comparison to see what we could get, and not just say, okay, sign off here. That's, that's my opinion. So does everybody feel the same? Or yeah, I, I, I don't know enough about this to, to okay. spend $15,000. Right, so, okay, no, 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 no. so can I get a motion to take this item? I'll make that motion. And a second? Second. All those in favor of tightening this item? Aye. Uh, Aye. Those opposed? Okay, let's move on to... Uh, Item number I, the resolution authorizing the repair of Robert's Drive. Can I get someone to introduce that resolution, please? I'll introduce you. Suspend the rules and we can tie along. Thank you, sir. Can I get a second? Second. All those in favor of reading my title only, please say aye. Aye. I suppose no. Mr. Martin, will you please read the resolution? A resolution authorizing payment of expenses for repair to Rob for repairs to Robert's Drive. Okay, anybody have any questions? I'm sorry, Mr. James, but <laughs> so y'all do the same thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, we adopt. I say. Thank you. Dr. Hilton, will you please call the roll? Close the pace. Close the pace? Yes. yes. Cedric Leonard? Yes. Michael James? Yes. Al Pierre? Yes. Mark Planner? Yes. Kevin Craig? Yes. 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 Mike Wigley? Yes. Claudia Hartness? Yes. Okay, item number J is resolution to amend the 2021 street improvement fund for Robert Strong. Can I get someone to introduce this resolution, please? Thank you, and I got a second from yes. Mr. Tyner. Um, all those in favor of reading by title only, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Resolution to amend the city of Monticello street improvement fund budget for 2021. Any discussion or questions? Digitizing paper land use plan map, $750. <coughs> and the uh, aerial photography, which is a total of 62, 61, 18. And that is less than $20,000. And I want to say, I'd like to do the water sewer line digitizing, but I think that um, we just got the sixth year this year. I'd like to um, clean our utility. Uh, our, uh, right away, driveways so. up and, and get a GPS location of all the manholes and all the lines from here to here but, and then digitize that. And I, you know, I don't know, it'd be great if we could get that done in a year. I'm not sure that that's that actually doable. Probably get um, it cleared up so we can get digitized. Right. Okay. Um, the sidewalk layer creation, 
I'd like to wait until we get the two sidewalks done that we're that are not and you know start that project. Um, I think that there's in my mind those are gonna happen in the next year. We let that happen, then we get that done. <coughs> um, also the trails layer creation. Mm -hmm. We're we're literally about to start the trail at the lake. And that is three phases, and this will just be phase one. Um, but you know, I hate to create, I hate to spend even a thousand dollars on it, and then we're in the process of doing more. And we could add that to our to our map. So, so if we do what you're recommending. Does that give the planning commission what they need to work and move forward? It gives them so a good start. It does. Okay. okay. And now I move we accept what you're recommending. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. James, uh, the city finance director informs me that that package totals about $16,000. And so if we wish to purchase that, you, in, in addition to adopting the resolution that is presented, we'll need to waive any bid requirements for that acquisition. Okay. We're under 20, but we're over 10. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, that's written in the resolution.
handle all that money? Can I get someone to introduce that resolution, please? I'll introduce someone who can suspend the move. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor of reading my title only, please signify by saying aye. All right. Those opposed, no. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Resolution to amend City of Monticello General Fund Budget 